Hi, it's Greg Gale, and welcome to the Six Steps to Financial Freedom, How to Become Financially Independent. Now, why I'm so passionate about this topic is I graduated college a long, 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 long time ago. And when I did, I had over $150,000 worth of debt. Now, that was between financial aid, multiple, multiple credit cards. I just got into a bad place where I was, I'd walk down campus, I'd get the right sign up for an immediate $500 card. I would use it. They would bump my limit. I'd walk down a little further. They'd give me another one, use that one. It just kept happening. And then they would open me up. I'd have had that card. They'd offer me a gas card and then another one. And it just became a problem. By the time I graduated college, I had 17 credit cards, mostly maxed out. Now, my credit was pretty decent because I was paying on time. But the trap was I was paying those minimum payments and just building a big hole because the interest was just compounding and compounding and in the wrong direction, right? We want compounding interest that's helping us accumulate wealth and become financially independent. I was getting destroyed by credit card interest. So I want to share with you some of the tactics that I've used to become now no credit cards. The ones I use are just to get points. They're paid off every month. I have my car payment and my house payment. That's it. Everything else gets plowed into savings. It was a long road, but it started with one step, one step, one step at a time. So I'm going to share you the, the exact roadmap, the playbook, so to speak, to becoming financially free. So the key to this is to move the slides. <laughs> We want you to learn how to master a personal family budget. Now, you might cringe a little bit when we say, hey, budget, and I'll move my little thing here. You don't need to see me on here anymore. I'll take you right through the, through the slideshow. So, not that one. This one. And we'll move this little guy. Thought I could move this thing out of here. So I can move this. Delete that. So the objective, my intention for this class for you right now is to learn how to master the personal budget. Now, a lot of feelings might start to come up. They're like, oh, man, I don't want to have to do a budget. I don't want to be held to a budget. I don't want to have to do something uh, weekly, monthly. I'll tell you, if you want to get a handle on your money, you've got to track it. You have to be knowing exactly where every penny is. It's called cash in, cash out. So what cash is coming in and what cash is going out. Now, I'm going to show you the tools to help you manage your money. You're going to see exactly where you're spending, how much you're saving. And honestly, you're, as you get those little wins, you almost get addicted to the winning, addicted to the savings. This is literally a game. So here's a little, little fun Jeopardy for you. So how, how many Americans live paycheck to paycheck? 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. 55% of the workforce have no pension, no retirement plan. You know, Social Security was first created when life expectancy, expectancy was 62 years, and now people are living well into their 80s. 62% of Americans retire with less than 10% of their income. 67% of Americans always or sometimes are worried about their money. So just raise your hand, and I'm raising mine back here. I still worry about money. Even though I have all that, I'm still trying to accumulate wealth all the time, budgeting, putting into savings. So I still budget, even though I tell you that my credit cards are paid off every month. I literally have one car payment and my house payment. I am acute, and then everything over my normal survival number that we're going to talk about is going right into savings. And that savings doesn't stay there for that long. It gets invested, and we're going to talk about that. 78% of Americans fear they aren't saving enough money for retirement, and it is true when you see these statistics right here. 55% have no pension. 76% paycheck to paycheck. Where's the money that even goes towards savings? But what happens is they're spending too much money. We are all spending too much money. So we have to get a handle on that. So if you're 45 years old 
and you put $100 per month in an investment that's giving you a 10% return, you will have $71,000 by the time you're 65. But if you had just started 10 years earlier, you would have 206. Now here's the crazy one, and I hope I have some people in their 20s on this because this is a game changer that I wish I had learned in my 20s. If you are 25 years old and you put just $100 away in an investment account, you will have over a half a million dollars in the bank by the time you're 65. That's something you can be retiring with. Now that's also can compound when you say, I've also put it in my 401k. I also have equity in my home. So there's many vehicles that we're gonna touch on, but it all starts with having the money to invest. Now here's an important rule, it's called the rule of 72. So the reason why I have these numbers in here, 45 years old to 65, that's 20 years. 35 years to 65, that's 30 years. And then 25 to 65, that's 40 years. All at a 10% return. So I wanna show you something. The law of 72, you don't need to read this, but this was figured out a very long time ago by a financial wizard. And he says, look, if you're, whatever percentage you're making, your money doubles in that period of time divided into 72. So if I have, if I'm making 10%, like in my previous example um, of the previous slide, you have your money doubles every seven years. Vice versa, if you're at 7%, your money is doubling every 10 years. So this is a very easy um, thing to show you right here. If you put $10,000 in, in 35 years, if you're only at 2%, your money will have doubled and then it'll take you to the 70th year to have it double again. But if I made 4%, that money goes, it doubles every 18 years, because the 4% goes into 72, 18 years. So every 18 years, that 10 doubles. And then same thing right here, if you're making 6%. So you want to pick an investment vehicle, ultimately, that's gonna pay you more interest, duh. But also we wanna protect against too much risk, because typically when you, if you want big returns, you're gonna to have to take big risks. So what you wanna to try to find is what's an investment vehicle. And, I, and to clarify, I'm not a financial planner, I'm just giving you some, some things that I've learned in my life is, you wanna, how do I max my percentage of growth, max that return on investment, but also decrease my risk exposure that it goes to nothing or below. And I'll tell you, I'm recording this right now. It's June, 2020. We're in the midst of the COVID, which we all, all had seen a, a significant drop in all our accounts. And I'll tell you, between my 401k, my 403b, which is a retirement account, my self-directed IRA, which is a retirement account, that is all in real estate, multifamily homes, who stopped paying their rent for two months now, uh, my Merrill Lynch account, those have all gone down. Uh, but I do have, and I'll show you uh, one of the things that I, uh, vehicles that I do have that has a floor. So you can, you can own, the lowest you'll ever earn is 1%. And then there's a max cap of what you will earn, which is 12%. So that fund, although I can't earn more than 12, I can never earn less than one. That is the one account I have it's called a variable life account, so it's tied to life insurance. That's the one account I've had, I've had it for over six years now, that has money that I can grab from it right now at cash value, tax-free, and I can not lose any money in the market because it's not tied to the market. So it's 1% return minimum, so it's pretty cool. But again, I'm not pushing products here, I'm just showing you that you can run it in the stock market that you could be getting 15, 20% on some of your investments, but you could also lose 20 to 30%. So let me show you a, a quick little grid here. This is a monthly spending formula, okay? And if you look here, you, you've got your money coming in from your job and you have a portion of the pie that's gonna go to your monthly bills, you know, eat grocery store, gas. You have a portion that obviously went to your taxes. You're gonna give some money away to charity, local businesses, things like that. And then obviously you have a chunk for your savings. Now depending on how you get the money will depend on you know, how you're able to use this, right? So if you have a ton of debt, there might not be a lot going into savings and giving. So there's about 35% is gonna be your monthly bills, 20% is savings, 
10% to giving, and about 30% goes to taxes. Now let's get into the six steps of financial freedom. This is what you want to be writing down. The six steps. Step number one is to track everything. Now think of it as, as if I wanted to lose weight. I would pull out a little book and I would journal what I'm eating at all times. And as I'm writing the stuff down, I will then be able to make some small corrections. Now I could also hire a dietitian, a personal trainer, some expert in that field, a nutritionist, to take a look at my journal and say, hey, what do I need to change? And that way I can make changes. So until you start writing it down, you're not able to make those changes. And I want you to think in terms of there's, you have three main accounts. You have a checking. So you have your normal check checking account that you're paying your bills from. You have a personal savings account, which is where basically your allowance is going to be. And then you have a money market. A money market is usually a very low interest bearing account with your bank. Um, we call it a float account. That you, you, The goal is to get three times your survival number in there. Now, I'll define the survival number. A survival number is how much minimum you need to survive every month. That is your mortgage or rent. That is your car payment. That is your credit card minimum balance. That's your Verizon bill, cell phone, T-Mobile, that is your cable, your water, uh, your electricity, your food and groceries, going out to eat. Now, I know you might say, well, I don't have to go to eat to survive. I'm saying if you were to budget going out to eat one night a week, date night with your spouse, what what would that look like? I still I consider that a survival number. Like the gym, I still put that as a survival number. Now, you, you might say, well, look, if I was really tight on money, I wouldn't have a gym membership. I agree. So you can cut it out if you want. If you want to really get into the savings, you could really tighten it up. But I want to, I want you to think survival in what's a long-term plan for you. So it'll have the gym membership. It's going to have one or two nights out to eat a week, maybe once a week. Um, but all those things go into your survival account. Now, three times that number. So if it costs you call it $4,000 to live every month, and that's your rent and car and minimum credit cards and cell phone bill and going out and groceries and kids and school and gymnastics and whatever it is. If it's 4,000, you want a money market account that's got 12 in it, three months of survival numbers. Now, now that should, I just want you to put yourself in that place. If you know exactly what you need every month and you've got three times that amount in an account somewhere, how does that just make you feel that you've got access to it? When something like COVID happens, you can go, huh, I'm actually not as freaked out as a lot of other people because the other people are the 76% that are paycheck to paycheck, that have nothing in savings. Part of that grouping that's going to retire and have $10,000, that's not the group I want to be in. I want to be the one that has the three times survival number. And then anything over that, is going into an account that's then going to get divvied out into my various investments. So step number two is to get rid of your consumer debt. The average credit card rate is 17%. That is crazy. The credit card companies charge some sort of a fee most of the time. Now, did you know that they're allowed to charge, they as in the credit card companies, can charge up to 27% interest. That is nuts to me. So I want you to think of when you have the extra money, so you've paid all those bills, you've done your survival numbers, we want to drive down your debt because the interest that you're paying there, 3%, 5%, 17%, 27%, will never be offset with what you could make it in the market. If I was to throw it into some stocks, you might go up, you know, 5%, 20%, I mean, you know, 5 or 10% right now. And again, I'm not a financial planner, but unless that interest is way out earning the credit card interest, I need to pay that debt down first because that stuff's just compounding. So we got to get out of that hole. So we need to be consumer debt free. That is step number two is, Get a handle on your finances by tracking it all down in step number one, and then drive down the balances utilizing step number two. Now three, three is where we're building that survival account. So we wanna get our money into that survival account. 
Now that doesn't include your money saved. That's on top of that. We, but we want to put a little piece in there to build that survival number. How do we build that number? And again, it starts with stepping on the scale, tracking your numbers. Now let me show you step number four is maximizing your retirement savings. So I don't know if you work for a company, you should be able to jump into the 401k. If a company matches, that is awesome. The Roth IRA is something that you can talk to your CPA about, talk to a financial planner about. If you need a recommendation, let me know. Um, the, the SEP, which is a self-employment pension fund, you know, there's maximums that you can contribute. So as you can see here right now, again, June 2020, you're, you're maxed out with your Roth IRA at 6000 um, you've got the 401k that you're maxed out. You got your SEP IRA that's maxed out. So you just got to figure out where you want to be. But I'm maxing that out first, and then I'm going to move my money around, maybe into the market. Uh, and that's what step number five. So step number five is where we talk about, you know, diversification. Now you've heard this before. I don't diversify until I'm all in on something first. So I'm getting on my debt. And I'm just going to go all in on this, you know, maybe it's the mutual fund, maybe it's an indexed fund, maybe it's variable annuities, but I'm going to go all in on that rather than splitting it all up. And again, this is where you want to get with a, with a, uh, a consultant, so to speak, a coach, right? Hire a financial wizard, talk with someone who saved a bunch of money and invested money. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this stuff. I'm super passionate about it, but I ultimately refer you to a professional. So we pick a mutual fund um, that has an average of um, stocks in there. We're going to have uh, two different mutual funds. There's different types of funds. There's an, an invest monthly dollar cost averaging basically means that let's just say you had five stocks you had picked. You picked up five stocks and you had $500. Dollar cost average would be you'd put $100 in each of your five stocks. And if you got $1,000, you'd put 200 in each of your five stocks. So you're averaging your dollars across the five investments. Um, creating accounts for your kids, 529 plans. Again, this is something to talk to a financial planner about. I'll tell you, part of the step number five is, is how you use the money. And so there's fixed ways to use your money where the, the investments are fixed. You've also got the variable where they can fluctuate up and down, and, and you can see where that goes down to negative 2% there. Think of it like, again, like the stock market, which just goes down. But then you can see number three there, the indexed is where there's a floor. It doesn't go down. It can only go up to some sort of a cap, but it will never go below the floor. The floor might be zero. The floor might be one. There's different funds available. So. As an example, here's the thing about risk, right? If I lose 50% of my money in the stock market or in anywhere, then what rate of return do I need to get it back up? So like 50% of $100 is $50. To get the 50 back up to 100, you've got to double it by 200%. As you can see, a 50% gain back up will only get me to 75, not the whole way. I need a hundred percent gain to go back up to where I was. So we got to think, how do I minimize the risk? And that's an example. The, the next would be, how do I, you know, reduce my impact on taxes? So, you know, one thing we talk about is earn more money, get rid of the debt. So you're not paying so much out to other people so you can save the money. But ultimately, what if I was to pay less taxes? So savings accounts and CDs are taxable. You can defer taxes like fixed annuities and savings bonds, but is there a tax advantage to cash accumulation policies like I was talking about with the life policy earlier? Again, these are things to talk with, with certified people about, but I'm giving you examples of how I've utilized my money, but also how do you thwart the negative, which is taxes? How do we not, because if I don't pay, if I defer taxes, if I don't pay them till a different time, then I'm winning because I have more money to utilize. So I just want you to think the situation of most households, most families live with too much debt and not enough protection on themselves. They have little to no savings with no clear understanding of how much savings is even enough. And again, this goes back to the budgeting. 
we got to write down, this is how much my rent was, this is how much I paid. This is my car payment, this is how much I paid. You should also know how much you owe on all those things. So I know I have this many more payments on the car, this many more payments on the house. Look, houses are 30-year mortgages, but you most like, mostly stay in the house maybe 10 years or so. But you can utilize that house as an asset. Like right now, we're leveraging people's houses to pull cash out from the equity, pay down the debt so they can have just a mortgage payment, just a car payment, maybe wipe everything out and just have the house. And then that extra residual cash, they're able to infuse into an investment and make money. So now they're making money on their money. And number three here is they don't make enough money and aren't really that sure of how to fix the problem. So it might be a way where we say, hey, look, with the way you're budgeting, we, we need more money. So do we need to maybe find another job? You know, they say that there, there's an old adage, the best time to have planted a tree was 50 years ago. But if you didn't plant it 50 years ago, the next best time is right now. And that goes back to my previous slide of, man, I wish I had done this when I was 25. I really got my head around my finances a little before 40. So like 38, 39, that's when I started really like gaining a lot of traction. I probably started more of the savings plans around 36, 37. But I'll tell you, there's a difference from when you learn it to when you implement it. So you might think, oh yeah, this sounds all great. But until you handwrite your own budget and start doing it on a monthly basis, it, the power is really in the execution. So what is the result of living like this, where we have too much debt, no insurance protection, we have very little savings, it's, it leads to stress and frustration. You know, the number one problem in most marriages and relationships is money, uh, can't have a negative impact on the family. And God forbid something happens to anybody, the, the not having insurance is, uh, I can't, I mean, I can't even bear to think. So the last part of this, and, and that's why it is step six, is to finally to prepay the mortgage, right? So if I'm already, you know, I'm already debt free. So I've gotten rid of the car now. I've gotten rid of the credit cards. I've got money invested. Well, as you get closer to that, I'm going to say 50 years old stage, that's when you start prepaying your mortgage. So if you're below 50, don't worry about it just yet. But that will come where we start hitting this. And that's really the last saving strategies. You want to you wanna figure out, if my interest rate on my house is call it three and a half, right? Then as long as my money's making more in the market, then I want to keep the house at the three and a half percent. But if my mortgage is at like five percent and your uh, return on investments are less than that, then I want to be paying off the house, right? Now sometimes short-term mortgages work out. That's something where you consult with a professional like myself. I'm a licensed loan officer. Um, we handle mortgage strategies, and sometimes it, it's not a good good idea. Uh, but sometimes it is. And again, uh, right now with rates being so low and equity so high, it's the perfect storm to pull out money off the home and pay down debt and really work on strategies for saving money and kind of hit the reset button to our debt, so to speak. So now the next one's really showing you the personal family budget. And if you email me, my email's on the on the last slide. You're gonna, I'm gonna send you a form just like this. And this is where you put in and you um, help, this helps you to prioritize and create and develop a budget and a budgeting system. And a system is something that's replicatable. You're gonna do every single month. And so you're gonna put in, if you look at the sheet here, you're gonna put in the balance of your, uh, of your auto loan and then place it right here. Ba balance of your other loan, put it right here. Balance of your credit cards, pull it right here. All the way down, and then here you're gonna put your mortgage. So if you had a mortgage, you put it here. If it's rent, I would just delete mortgage and leave rent, that way you know you know what it is. All these things you can delete if you're like, oh, I don't pay gas here, it's included in my rent, that's fine, just delete it. You can make short short here. If you don't get your hair and nails done, right, get rid of it. If you don't golf or country, go get rid of it, right? But the bottom line is you're going to have your minimum monthly owed is in column two. I'll show you here a live version. So column one, it's customized to fit you exactly what is yours, but you can take out whatever. Column two is where you write the minimum owed, as I mentioned. So even though your uh, the balance of your mortgage is 235, 692 right here, oops, right here. 
the payment is here. Now, in this example, this person overpaid it. So up here, paid the car, the minimum payment, paid the minimum, paid the minimum. Paid, here's the minimum on the credit card, paid 2100 Minimum here, paid 4000 because they're really trying to whack down this debt, right? The balance here is $11,000. they are going to pay four, so next month it'll show around seven as long as they didn't use it. Um, cable internet, that's the minimum. Maybe they, they bought a couple movies or something, that's why it's a little higher. Cell phone, same thing, a couple extra minutes. Dry cleaner, normally it's 125 It was a little cheaper this month, so you can see where we're putting down. Here's the normal minimum, like right here. 975 but they spent less on groceries this month but they had a little more entertainment so maybe they went out to eat more often right uh, and so here column three is where you're gonna put one-time expenses like vacations repairs special needs so you know some other stuff you might have done over here um, that maybe is not normal like vacation isn't an every month thing spending you know depends on how, what what kind of month you had right now if you pay down debt, like example right here, they had a minimum of a thousand of a hundred, they paid twenty one hundred, that means they saved two thousand dollars. And so this goes in our savings category down the bottom here. So technically they saved ten thousand dollars because this was that going down to pay down debt. Again, that to me is a win. Like I'm winning because I'm paying that much in debt. If you have a 401k, we show that over here, if this had a 401k, you'd show this over here in savings because it's taken out pre-tax. So we add all that stuff up. Now, over here, here's where you put your money coming in. So this is husband and wife. So the husband brought in 5230, then 5230, wife brought in 3212, then 3013. Here's the total of their income for the whole month. So show you how this looks at the very bottom. So again, all these money's received. Now I actually put in here. You know, checks received, people pay me money back, I got a couple of refunds from Target, Costco, those all go in here because that's money coming in goes in column five. Money going out is in column three. And again, you'll you'll get this down um, the more we practice on it, right? The best way to, to, you know, get good at something is to just do it and then do it often. Keep repeating it. So here you're keeping a balance. This is kind of like a, a balancing book sheet, right? So... 401k, here's my balance. Mutual fund, that's how much I've got in there. And notice the, the mutual fund is, is where we want to have our three times um, our number for the um, float, right? We got the stock balance, equity in your, your home, equity in rentals. Here's where it is. Here's your money market balance. Here's the money market, oh sorry, here's the money market float. Need to be three times your survival number. So that's this one. And again, I believe the survival, if we go back in here, was about 7,000. So that would be the, the three times that amount that we have in there. Percent of your monthly income saved. So 59% of the income from column five was saved into column four. That's awesome. Money saved per month for this month in particular. Cash net worth. And your total net worth, that be cash net worth is is just these things right here. Total net worth is the cash net worth plus your equity in a home, and then whatever money you gave away that month. So here's how it all looks together on one sheet. I know this is a lot, but you will get used to it. So again, this form shows you all of your expenses listed out here with the balances. Here is the minimum payment. Here's what you actually paid. Here is how much, so we just minus these to figure out how much did you save. No, it only counts as savings. Like this one right here has the life insurance. So it says 500, but it says 400 saved. That's because 100 of the 500 is for the insurance policy. 400 is going towards an investment, like the investment account that has that floor and the cap. Um, mortgage, you overpaid. There's 1,000 there. There's 500 that went into the money market, 2,000 that just went straight into savings, an extra 350 towards the student aid loan. So these two will match because this is how much cash I brought in, these are how many bills I paid, and whatever was left over went into the savings. So here's the 2,000 that went into savings, here's the extra 350 that went here, and then down here is those same calculations that were right here, we just put them right here. Okay, now that's all we got. Now again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is super important because we don't work to work. We work so we can live. 
And it's not so much what you make, it's what you keep. So I have people that make really good money, but they spend a lot. And so they don't have a lot saved. But then I have some that make like okay money, but are power savers, like addicted to saving. And they're able to wipe out debt, go on vacations, have nice investments. They just keep it super simple. But I'll tell you, it's from putting in the work of stepping on the scale every month. And the first thing I will have you do is reply back to me and I will send you the budgeting spreadsheet. I will also go over it with you. And you can see this link down here below, the calendly.com slash the Gale team slash money. If you go to that link, you can book a free, no obligation appointment with me. I'm happy to talk about the slides specific to your situation. I'll send you the spreadsheet. You can edit those columns to have exactly what you spend your money on. That way you can get a handle on this. That way you can stay protected. And then I'm happy to refer you to my financial planner referrals, um, depending on how our talk goes and where you should go, so that you can have some educated advice from someone who's licensed and certified in those areas. So once again, if you have any questions, here's my phone number right here. Then my email right there, greg.gale at novahomeloans.com. And also the link, the very bottom, calendly.com slash the Gale team slash money to book an appointment. All right. Have a great day.